On a sunny September afternoon in 1979, I stood at the water's edge of First Beach in Newport, Rhode Island. It was orientation week for the freshman class at Brown University, and we were on a school-sponsored outing. I spent the day swimming, playing football, and catching frisbees. Happy and tired, I was soaking up the sun before we headed back to campus. Not far from me sat a handsome, bored-looking group, obviously private school graduates. They were easy to spot, set off to themselves, a blasé tribe wearing varnay sunglasses, untucked button-downs, and baggy shorts. Only one of them, a good-looking guy with an athlete's body and a head full of brown curls, seemed to be genuinely enjoying himself, swimming and horsing around in the water. I had just graduated from the Lawrenceville School, an all-boys prep school in New Jersey. I'd spent the summer in Venice Beach, California, surfing, drinking San Miguel's, and hanging out until the sun went down. I thought I knew the beach better than anyone. So, being 18 years old and competitive, I'd used the day to establish my alpha dog status among my new peers. I'd caught more passes, rode more waves, and spiked more volleyballs than the next guy. I looked nothing like the J. Crew ad seated near me. I was 6 feet 2 and weighed 210 pounds, built more like a Midwestern farm boy than an East Coast patrician. My hair was plastered with seaweed, and I had a mouthful of stainless steel orthodontic work. I realized later, to my horror, that there were flecks of seaweed, the exact same green as the yin-yang symbol on my board shorts, stuck in my braces. But none of that seemed to matter to the curly-haired fellow I'd noticed a few minutes before. He walked up to me, stuck out his hand, and said, Yo, my name's John. What's yours? Matching his friendly tone, I answered, Rob Littell, and we shook hands. John and I swapped high school war stories for half an hour or so. He'd gone to Andover, a storied prep school in Massachusetts. I told him I was playing lacrosse for Brown. He told me he'd never played a team sport but was considering rugby. We hit it off immediately. He was cool, funny, and restless. He laughed at my oddball sense of humor. I liked his good-natured confidence. Someone blew a whistle and we filed back onto a bunch of old yellow school buses. Bouncing towards Providence battling motion sickness and a carbon monoxide headache, I dimly heard my new roommate, Bradley Forster, say that the guy I'd been talking with was John F. Kennedy, Jr. This was news to me. I had no idea that he was at Brown, or even that he was such a big deal. In high school, I'd played sports, period. If People Magazine existed in those days, we didn't get it at our house. I muttered to Bradley that John seemed friendly enough, and I returned to my nausea. I remember being vaguely proud of my ignorance. The next time I saw John was the following week, at my dormitory on the north side of campus. I was returning from class one afternoon and found him penning a note on the little bulletin board I'd velcroed to the wall of my cinder block alcove. He'd stop by to say hi, so I treated him to a sampling of the B-52s and the talking heads. I was glad to see him. We clashed immediately over music. I was into New Wave while John was a throwback a purist who preferred rock and roll to pop, and the Rolling Stones to everything, and argued happily for an hour. John told me to come by his room sometime, so a few days later I headed over there. I remember thinking it was like an experiment. I'd see how it felt, if it would be easy and fun, or awkward and not worth the effort.